Okay, if we can just pull up the presentation, let's see. Good morning. <laughs> okay, so I'm assuming that there are several entrepreneurs in the room uh, and uh, maybe investors as well. So I'm going to take some time to talk a little bit about growth. I run Growth for Ways, uh, which is now part of Google. And a lot of people ask, um, are you able to stay autonomous? Are you still growing? I've even heard, do you still exist as your own product? So the answer is yes. And I'm going to talk about how we've handled growth inside of a big company. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of what we're working on now. So I start almost every presentation with a reminder of why we made ways. For anyone who doesn't know, it's real-time navigation and traffic, all crowdsourced. So the idea is, if we're all driving on the road together, we know the speeds, and we can route you around traffic and hopefully save everyone time. So that's the entire mission, is to save people even five minutes a day, every day. So this is, I can't give numbers, but I can at least show you that we've continued to grow since the Google acquisition. Um, and it's incredible that uh, as an autonomous unit, we're able to continue to focus on our own product roadmap and then more importantly, our growth and figure out the best way to approach that for ourselves. So first of all, the team. You know, people talk a lot about growth. What is it? Is it marketing? Is it PR? Is it business development? Is it viral loops and the product? Is it analytics and BI, business intelligence? And it's all of those things. And it's very difficult for organizations to be able to have an embedded, unified team like this. And for us, it was incredibly important. So if we see a spike on one day, or if something is going extremely well in a market, we have to be able to understand what's happening where, why is it working, why is it not working. And so we're very, very data-driven in terms of how we're figuring out what's working, and we're very hard on ourselves. So the approach to the team is really the most important thing for us. Every person at Waze contributes to our growth, right? Every product manager, every engineer, that's what we're all working toward. And so it's important that we approach that by making sure that we're all uh, on the same page and know what's happening in the company. So we have a lot of activities, but we try to focus it around a couple of core engines. And this is our core engine, one of them. And it's this idea of major traffic events. It could be a marathon, it could be a, a crisis event, a flood. And whatever it is, we need to be able to understand in real time that something's happening and make sure that you're not routed through it. So this idea of these events, that's our content. And the idea is when you have that content, to be able to distribute it through as many channels as possible, and that will continue to drive growth, engagement. When people stop using the application, for all of you who have apps, one of the primary reasons is what? They forget. They want to be reminded, but they don't want to be spammed. So how can we take this content and make sure that it's distributed through the application to people in a way that makes it a service? So if I'm on the way from point A to point B, you should really only be telling me things that are going to affect me. And that's what we're working to do. So we've obviously got a lot of channels. We've got the users through the app. We've got PR and marketing, uh, social media, and then some channels that are unique to ways, uh, broadcasters and cities themselves and, of course, carriers. So in the app, here's what it looks like when there's an event going on. We'll send a notification and put something into the inbox that tries to give you a little more information about what's happening. And that could be, again, a parade or a marathon. It could be a crisis event. It could be weather. We're spending a lot of time right now trying to understand algorithmically what is different in these traffic patterns today, at this moment, than average. And then being able to look for signals in the data to figure out what it is, and then automatically be able to send you the relevant information. 
In addition to that, we also have some fun things. Waze is known, I think, for being a pretty optimistic and, and fun way to be stuck in traffic. So just a couple of the voices uh, that we've had in our app is uh, Terry Crews from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, who was basically yelling at you <laughs> throughout your journey, but people loved it. Uh, and it was actually on the Conan O'Brien show, which I don't know if any of you know that, but it's a, a very popular nighttime talk show. And it generated over 100 million media impressions just from having this voice in our app. Then during World Cup in Brazil, uh, we worked with a couple of the very famous uh, uh, sportscasters, the announcers, to create uh, a journey experience during World Cup that was very celebratory and, and everybody knew the voices. 65% of all of our Brazilian users downloaded that voice. It's an incredible engagement. And so how are you going to, um, to provide people with, with an exciting experience and keep it fresh and engaging? You want to be reliable, but you also want to keep it fresh. On the broadcast side, uh, we have 86 TV stations around the world that use us to provide their traffic information in the morning. And this is not only a great validation of our data, but you can imagine it's a huge driver of our new registered users as well. So this is a program that happened by accident uh, because of, I think some of you may know the story, uh, but there was a giant stretch about 10 miles of the 405, which was a big highway in Los Angeles that was going to be shut down, displacing almost 500,000 vehicles over the course of that weekend. So scrambling to figure out what to do, uh, the TV station thought that crowdsourcing would be a good bet. So they brought us in, and at the end of the weekend, they didn't want to stop using it, and we figured out that it could be uh, a platform that would be successful for us. So by accident or by taking advantage of opportunities, we were able to turn this you know, uh, one-time opportunity into something that we've been growing for three years now. Carriers and OEMs, we have worked with about 12 carrier partners around the world, uh, and mostly co-marketing. So they'll promote us exclusively to their user base for a certain period of time, and we'll whitelist them uh, so that they'll be able to offer uh, free data for Waze. That's been the primary model. Uh, just this week, though, uh, we were able to take advantage of one uh, great Google opportunity, uh, which is that we are now uh, officially an option on the Google GMS, which is the Android uh, Google Mobile Services um, platform. And so it took some time, but now any carrier and OEM is able to just check a box and have Waze pre-installed in their devices. So we think that this will be a great driver. And uh, finally, Connected Citizens. This is something that we just launched this past October, and it's working with, so, oh, well, you can see it yourself. Go ahead, you can keep going. No problem. In Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, traffic is a very important issue. We have almost seven million people here, going from A to B to C to D. From the first phone call that we have, two weeks later, we were there inside of Waze application with APIs, bringing to the operations center every information that we agreed to share. We have the channel, we have the data, and we need to shorten the distance between the citizens and the city hall. With 400,000 Wazers in Rio de Janeiro, 50,000 users every day, it's like we have an army of public agents talking to us. As many Wazers that we have, the more this number grows, more efficient and more deeply this tool will work. So that's Rio. Uh, and in October, we launched the program, which is essentially a data exchange, where we provide publicly available information on our incidents and our, our road closures, and then the cities provide us that same information in return. So if we care a lot about our content, right, our engine is about getting those events, then working with cities is a tremendous way to get access to that information and continue to scale our engine, and it keeps building on itself. Um, the wonderful thing from our perspective, though, is that our data is being used to do tremendous things around the world. And what we're able to look at now is not just how to save every individual time, but look at the city as a whole. So those are just a few areas that we focus on and how we're approaching our growth. 
I hope it's helpful to some of you guys. But I want to drill down now a little bit more into the Connected Citizens program and show you uh, just a little bit of the early impact that it's now had. Uh, and I'll start off with a, another video. tremendous amount of data uh, that we're able to collect uh, primarily anonymously around the world anytime that a Wazer is driving, understanding those speeds, uh, reporting on accidents, hazards, uh, police activity. And so um, having access to this much data we feel is also a bit of an obligation to us. Um, so we started working with just 10 cities. We called it the W10. Barcelona was one of them and the government of Catalonia was another one of our early partners. Uh, now we're at 23 um, uh, DOTs and cities around the world uh, and they're trying to figure out for the first time what to do with all of that data. It's not like they've been waiting for it and then all of a sudden they know what to do with it when they get it. So the first step is taking it, making sure it goes into their traffic operations center, a tremendous amount of analysis between them and us. Uh, but the interesting thing is when you watch these over different cities, you can see that the patterns are completely different and therefore the problems in the traffic are completely different. So if you look at the top one, uh, this is a city uh, like Los Angeles, Boston. What you're seeing are that we have these huge peaks and road capacity or the number of roads is not really the problem. The problem is that we don't uh, distribute it well over time, right? And if you look at the bottom one, uh, this is Rio, it's Jakarta, uh, it's a lot of our other partner cities where traffic starts in the morning and it just stays <laughs> until they go to bed at night. And this is a problem of capacity. So we're looking at how can you create systems that are dealing with both of these kinds of problems and the group of, of cities that we have on board now are actually sharing uh, data analysis with each other, they're sharing their case studies with each other, they've become a community of people that are helping uh, share knowledge across the world which is pretty cool. Now the program is new but I'll show you just a couple of examples of what they're doing. Uh, so these are all from Rio uh, because they were the first to, uh, to bring us into their, um, into their traffic management center. You can see this election analysis right here. They had two elections last year. Uh, and then what they did was on the first election, they looked at all of the um, traffic that was coming in from Waze to figure out if they appropriately distributed the traffic personnel. And then by the time the second election came along, they had actually had a new traffic management personnel uh, plan based on that original Waze data. So they're already using that information. Uh, they're using the data to figure out where to put their traffic monitoring cameras, uh, to um, uh, change garbage collection points. Through the Waze data, they've realized that they were creating congestion <laughs> uh, through their garbage routes. Uh, and that this was incredibly inefficient. So they've already started to make those changes. Uh, and then, of course, real-time response to incidents. We've had um, some police in the UK actually tell us that they rely on Waze because information will often come from citizens before it comes into their own traffic management center. So they feel they can be at the scene of an accident faster. Just a couple of other examples. Um, in Boston, 
recently, um, the fire department decided that they needed to use ways for their uh, routing. They've never had access to the whole city's worth of real-time congestion information. So in their planning about routes at specific times of days uh, during the during a fire or an emergency, they're now able to use that information. And they're not going to start off completely changing their plans, but they have an alternative now that they're able to compare. Uh, and this is something that they feel is incredibly important. We also have the ability, I don't know if you've been following uh, how much snow the east coast of the US has been getting this year. It's pretty intense. Um, we have now snow plows that have live feeds going into ways and a snow plow icon so that if you are a citizen of Boston, you're going to be able to know if the road to your office has been plowed or not in real time, all from within this application. So what we're trying to do is make sure that all the data we bring in, we're surfacing only what's relevant to you, but surface more and more so that you're going to be safe and efficient along your route. My favorite example, though, is what's happening in Los Angeles. They are they're the, the, the worst in terms of that distribution problem. Uh, what can take you 45 minutes normally in peak traffic might take two and a half hours. So this is five hours people are spending commuting just to be able to get to work. Um, so the city is looking at flexibility of commute times and what would make you leave earlier or later? If we could tell you that if you left 30 minutes earlier you would save an hour, would you do it? Uh, we think that some will. And so this is what we're working on with them. And this is exciting because we might want to save you time every day, but we've never really been able to measure it. And now we're just approaching that. To the issue of obligation, uh, Boston has also come out with something interesting where if a citizen reports a pothole, they're, they're going to make a commitment to fix it in 48 hours. This I love because when you have access to information, when you have a citizen base that you're asking for help and they're giving it to you, you're obligated to do something about it. Otherwise, they'll lose complete confidence and they won't offer you information again. So that obligation, I find fascinating. Um, and that all of our partners are taking it all very, very seriously, this idea of um, not a top-down you know, connected city approach, but a bottoms up connected citizen approach. They realize that they have to use crowdsourcing. They realize that their citizens are a tremendous asset, and now they need to create that dialogue directly. If I look at the industry as a whole, it starts to become still a little fuzzy, but there's a kind of a clearer picture being developed uh, around where this is going. So I talked to you about the Waze perspective, right, which is lots and lots of data being given to the cities and how they're going to be able to respond to it uh, from a, a, a personal transport um, and urban mobility perspective. But you look at the other trends, uh, all of the new carpool apps that are coming out, you look at Uber and all of the friction that they've been able to reduce, Google Shopping Express and Instacart, making it so that you don't have to have people running all over the roads uh, doing their personal errands. That's people that are off the road. And if you notice what they do, they give you a time window. And that time window means that everyone doesn't have to be out on the road at the same time. So these are incredibly exciting. Um, and then you've got the notion of connected cars that are just going to be giving you as uh, much information as is coming from the citizens. When you put that all together, you see what's evolving is a completely new platform for personal transport. And not just humans, but also goods, right? We're not going to be going to the grocery store. We're not going to be having uh, empty buses and archaic bus lines. The idea, I hope, we're getting to is that we're going to be able to have a very, very efficient uh, system that is dynamic and responsive. So we might not be building the, the public transportation system of the future that we thought even a couple years ago with very expensive trains um, that are maybe not going to adapt to the real mobility patterns five years from now. So we need to start thinking about those things. And I call it the UPSization of personal transport and of cities because as I look at how all of these things come together and what role we want to play in the future, I'm greatly inspired by the, the old company, UPS, and how they've disrupted transportation on the commercial goods side. So it's all completely data-driven. Many of you might know the, the idea that they discovered from their data of not taking left turns. 
So by eliminating left turns, they found they were able to reduce idling time. And since 2004, they've saved about 10 million gallons of gas and taken the equivalent of 5,300 cars off the road every year. Uh, so I think we need to look at what they were able to do for the commercial space and how all of these trends are coming together to figure out what we're going to be doing on the personal transport, personal mobility side in our cities. And that's what's really exciting me now. What I want to do, though, is um, we've got five minutes left. I wanted to save some time for Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think there, there are mics coming around. Somebody must have a question. Really now? Over here. That would have been the first time it ever happened where there was no question. Hi, my, my name is Juan. Thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to know how, how you reward your users, what they get uh, for uh, sharing this information with, with your platform. So most people share information with the platform just by turning it on and driving. We make it incredibly low friction, so what they get is a reliable service um, that has the best data. So at the heart, you need to have a product that is going to serve people well. So that's the base. But we also have always um, had an incentive structure that gave things like points and swords and shields. The more you report, the, 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 your avatar will get a sword and a shield, and if you're uh, a very engaged Waze user, even a crown. Uh, but what you get is also, on the algorithm side, if we know that your reports are reliable or you're a map editor that goes onto the web to actually change a road or, or give us some information, uh, then your, um, your score, your rank for every edit you make is higher. So you could overturn something from a new user if they did it incorrectly, and no, it would be very difficult for anyone else to overturn your edits. So there's a whole series of layers of what it means to be a member of the Waze community. Hi, my name is Greg. Um, so with the merge with Google, are you planning to also integrate with the Google Maps? So right now, I, at the beginning of the talk, I tried to address that right now we're completely autonomous and we're continuing to build on our own roadmap. We solve a very unique problem, a very specific problem. And Google Maps is fantastic for solving a broad swath of issues, right? If it's uh, public transport and walking and, and discovery and search and all of that. So we're just focused on doing our, our part to, to uh, reduce congestion. Hi, uh, my name's Sam. Um, how much help have you had from Google's employees to um, to grow ways? Do you you know do you get teams of Googlers coming and surrounding you and giving you like a, a boost? How does it work? <laughs> the um, the GMS option that I just said that we now were, I would say, is my first bet on on distribution via Google. That's it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Terry. Uh, my question is, y you obviously get a, a huge amount of data from uh, the users. How do you make determination whether some data are good or, you know, how do you, how old do you keep it? You know, some, um, they say people reporting police, but you know, how, how long do you keep that data? So it depends on the kind of report. So let's just take reports, right? Uh, police, accident, whatever. Each one ages in a different way. Uh, so an accident might age for, and we're always changing the algorithms, so say 30 minutes or an hour, and then it will go away. Unless somebody gives it a thumbs up, then it starts the clock over again. Uh, that would be a smaller one for a police, uh, police officer being reported or something. Then in terms of the broader data set, um, we don't store it very long. What we store is the uh, anonymized or aggregated versions of the data so that we can get a sense of what happened, what were the speeds at that time of day on that road segment, uh, but we're, we don't store any individual data. We're, we're uh, pretty strong about that, about not storing that.
See, all it takes is one to ask the first question, and then they all come. Then we're having a conversation all together. We're all shy. Um, my name's Andy. I'm wondering whether, if you're, you were saying that with, in London, you're, the police are using waves to, to find traffic incidents. Could you be supplying news networks and other organizations with information that they could use? So currently, it's only the TV stations, and we just opened up to radio stations to be able to get access to a special version, version of the app. It's not the actual data itself. Right now, we're only sharing the data with the cities um, as we learn what's broken in our APIs, what needs to be fixed. Like that snowplow uh, feed we added because one of our partners asked for it. Uh, we also uh, added a confidence score to our API for them. So we're still, it's, it's a very immature system. So I don't think it's really ready yet uh, to be shared more broadly. Um, beyond just traffic, but if this is a, an incident happening, you know, a spontaneous thing which the news organizations would be interested in, not just from a traffic standpoint, yeah. but there's something happening oh, now. Oh, on these major traffic events, absolutely. So part of the distribution is that we will automatically send those alerts that go into your phone to any news agencies that, that sign up or that are partners. Um, but if you're in a news agency and you're not our partner, we're happy to also still push that information out to you. We, we think that it's critical that these important events go out as widely as possible and in real time. We're out of time. Thank you all so much. Have a good conference. Thank you, Deanne.